uh, I do appreciate all of you that have come tonight. Uh, in our church in El Paso, I pastor several hundred people. We have a larger church. And we started these tournaments about 20 years ago, and it's become one of the uh, very best uh, ministries that we do. We get sometimes up to 100 or more uh, visitors, uh, 30, 40. Uh, I think our record is about 48 different teams uh, playing in a tournament. We have our parking lot set up to accommodate four games at a time. And it has been a great way of reaching out to the community and uh, making our church building and our facilities available uh, for people to come. And we've had numbers of people uh, over the years join our church and make it a regular part of their lives. So I, I do appreciate uh, you being here. Um, I'm 66. In my day, I had game, but I don't anymore. Otherwise, I would uh, run around with some of you tonight, but I'm going to watch. But I want to just share a very brief uh, message with you tonight, and it has to do actually with my, uh, what we call a testimony, a personal account of where I came from and what God has done in my life. When I say things like mental illness, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, addiction, suicide, violence, hatred, people that have an inability to forgive, violence, relational dysfunction. These are all attributes. Most of those things were my life and the life of my family. I had a mother who was seriously mentally ill uh, all through my childhood back in those days in the 50s and 60s. There really weren't a lot of answers. There were psychiatrists. There were some medications uh, I would say that my mother probably suffered from bipolar disorder. She lived with a lot of rage, a lot of anger, uh, and then she could flip very easily and be the life of the party. She had a great personality uh, when she was on, uh, but a very destructive side to her uh, nature that tormented us as children. My father was a hard liquor alcoholic from the time he was a, a teenager. Uh, probably 18 or 19 is when he started drinking with uh, one of his brothers, my uncle Gilly, uh, and this turned into a lifelong destructive habit, and so I was raised uh, in that kind of atmosphere. I have two brothers, both of them older than myself, that committed suicide. One of them took an overdose of, um, of uh, alcohol and uh, some kind of medication, sat down in a chair, uh, went unconscious. Three days later, my father uh, found him sitting in that chair in Albuquerque, New Mexico. My other brother, just a few years later, after I had moved from London, uh, I was pastoring at the time. I moved from London to El Paso to take over the church that I now pastor. Uh, my second brother uh, drove up to Mount Lemmon outside of Tucson, Arizona. Uh, he had been married and divorced. He had three children that were about seven uh, nine and maybe 12 at the time, and he took a gun to his head, suffered from depression and a lot of the things that I just mentioned. So I want to ask you a question tonight. Why are we the way we are? Why? There's several dozen people here tonight, all kinds of different personalities and attributes. Some of you may reflect some of the things that I mentioned. You struggle in life. There's torments and guilt and insecurities and fears, an inability to bond relationally with other people. We go from one relationship to another. So the question is why? Why are we the way we are in life? Is it just coincidence that you have the personality that you have or the struggles that you have, the difficulties, the problems that are internal? Is that just chance or happenstance, uh, my, my point is that it isn't. There is a reason why you are the way you are. There's a reason why, as I grew up in life, I became an alcoholic just like my father, a drug addict. Uh, by the time I was 16, 17 years old, uh, suffered from a spirit of suicide that tormented me. I wanted to take my life, uh, struggled with the depression. Uh, even after I became a Christian, it took some time for me to come out from underneath uh, uh, all of those dynamics that were playing out 
in my life. So I want to read two scriptures for you tonight. And what, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, the Bible talks about you. The Bible has you in mind when it makes certain statements uh, and we read uh, uh, various accounts and stories uh, and pieces of wisdom. Uh, and when I became a Christian, uh, I was blown away with how much the Word of God related to the person that I was uh, and to what was going on in my life. The first scripture I want to read to you, and this goes to why are you the way you are? Why? And this scripture is found in Exodus chapter 34, verse 7. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children of the third and the fourth generation. That means that the behavior of a father or a mother for that matter has an incredibly profound and powerful effect upon children for good or bad. Studies now show, for example, that a child will never recover from the divorce of their parents. They'll go on and live life, but they're going to struggle with various fears and insecurities and uncertainties, and the chances are four times more likely that they themselves will divorce. So statistically, we can see the veracity and the truth of that scripture. I pastor many, many young people. You guys look just like my church looks. If I could translate you, it would look pretty much the same. Lots of young people in my church, many of them fatherless or had abuse uh, when they were children. Uh, and this has profoundly impacted uh, the people that they are today. It's not an excuse. You don't run around blaming everyone and everything. It's a reason, though, why we are the way we are. It's our upbringing. It's what was put into us. It's the trauma that we went through. It's the life experience we had. And the second scripture I want to read to you is out of Judges chapter 11. And it's about a young man, I think, that is like a lot of young men today. And I want to read just three verses. Now, Jephthah was a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of a harlot. What happened was his father was a man named uh, Gilead. Gilead was married. Gilead had children. We don't have an explanation, but one night he went out on the town and slept with a hooker. She got pregnant. She had a child. She knew who the father was when the child was born. She took the child to the father's house, laid him on the doorstep, knocked on the door and ran away. And so Gilead and his wife took this baby in raised him. He's done nothing wrong. He's a, he's a victim of his father's sin, a product of his father's irresponsibility. He was the son of a harlot, and Gilead begat him through that harlot. Gilead had a wife. She bore other sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out. And said to him, you shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers, dwelt in the land of Tob, and worthless men banded together with Jephthah, and they went out raiding. That may be the first account in the Bible of a gang forming of angry young men who had been violated and abused in their life. And I think the worst part of our story is not that he went out, slept with a harlot, had a baby. It's that when the brothers, his stepbrothers, his half-brothers got together and threw him out of the house, his father didn't stop it. He just watched it play out. And you can see this young man walking away from his house. He's done nothing wrong. He's just simply been born. He didn't ask for this. And he grows up angry and frustrated. And he starts running around with other angry and frustrated young men. So I want you to consider tonight the possibility of a curse operating in your life. Something passed on from those that have gone before you. The scripture that I read to you says, visiting the sin or the iniquity of the father upon the children. 
It's not talking about the father going into a convenience store and stealing a candy bar. It's talking about who the father is. He may be a thief or a, or a pervert or violent or angry or bitter. Uh, uh, who knows? It's what identifies is him as a man is going to become part of the identity of the child. Can't stop it. My mother used to sit my brother and I down. My first brother was 14 years older than myself. So that by the time I came of age, she was already uh, out of the house. And I remember my mother sitting my brother and I down. She hated my dad. My parents never divorced, but the household was filled with violence and, uh, and a, just a horrible atmosphere all through my childhood. My earliest memories uh, are very dark and very fearful. And my mother would, would, would teach us literally to hate my dad. She would sit my brother down. And I remember occasions of her sitting my brother and I down and talking about what a horrible person my dad was. And this went on for years. And so I grew up hating my father. The iniquity of the fathers. Even though I grew up hating my dad, and I did, she succeeded in putting things into my heart and my mind as a young boy. And even though that was the case, I grew up, by the time I was 15, I was my dad. I was a full-blown alcoholic. From the moment I started drinking uh, at a very young age, I couldn't stop. I would drink until I passed out. Uh, my friends would have to take me from the party uh, and drop me off on my front porch. Uh, there were occasions where I woke up in my own vomit. Uh, I didn't know where I'd been. One day I woke up, one Saturday morning I woke up, uh, went out to my van, and the front of it was smashed uh, with red paint over it. I have no idea what happened. I don't remember. Sociologists now agree that things are passed from generation to generation. Two-thirds of all prisoners have family members in prison. Why is that? I don't have any of my family members in prison. It's because there are certain things connected with families. Sociologist Judith Wallerstein wrote a book called The Unexpected Legacy of Divorce. And she writes that national studies show that children from divorce uh, and remarried families are more aggressive toward their parents and teachers. They experience more depression, more uh, learning difficulties, more problems with peers uh, than do children from intact families. They're more likely to be referred for psychological help at school than their peers uh, from intact families. More children born out of wedlock, less marriage, and more divorce. That's our world today. And it flows from one generation uh, into the next generation. The, the myth of the early 70s, which is when I was uh, uh, growing up, I was in high school, I was born in 1954. The myth of the early 70s was, oh, divorce is a good thing. Uh, if parents aren't happy, they need to do what makes them happy. Uh, and children are resilient and they'll get over it. Uh, that has now been proven to be factually incorrect. Children don't recover. It puts a scar in their, in their spirit, in their, in their character uh, that plays out in the decisions that they make uh, later on in life. Alcoholism, violence, suicide, drug abuse, sexual abuse, perversion are all more likely when the father himself indulged. So the why of who we are is what we're considering. We are who we are for a reason. It's not about blame. It's a reason. It's about reality. And the word here that I want to draw your attention to is the word resemblance. You will resemble. You may not even have known your father, but I guarantee you, you resemble him physically for sure. But that physical resemblance uh, is simply a reflection uh, of emotional and spiritual resemblance. I have a friend uh, who got saved uh, uh, as a young man, but he grew up as a professional gambler. He never knew his father. And to make a very long story short, uh, eventually him and his father met. This was after he became a Christian and after he was pastoring uh, and had a ministry. And when he met his father, 
He was shocked to discover his father was a gambler. And they, after they talked, uh, they discovered that they were actually in the same casinos at the same time, but he had never met him. The sins of the father, the habits, the attributes of the father are passed on to the children. To the third and the fourth generation, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the very popular singer named Whitney Houston. She died a number of years ago as a result of a drug overdose. She drowned in her bathroom. She had five drugs in her system, including cocaine and cannabis. And as she passed out, she slid under the water, passed out, went unconscious, and died. Whitney Houston. Four years later, this is not just a coincidence. Four years later, her daughter Bobby was found unconscious in a bathtub with drugs in her system, went into a coma and died four months later. Sociologists are starting to call it the five generation rule that there are attributes that flow from fathers or mothers uh, into children uh, and their children and their children's children. Uh, they're calling it a five generation rule that those attributes uh, are very easily seen and recognized. So the question is, what do we do about it? My wife is here tonight, Renee. We've been married for 46 years. We got married in sin, turmoil, sexual immorality, drug addiction, alcoholism. I was 19 at the time. She was 18. We took off immediately after uh, we got married to an uncertain future. We drove up to Oregon. I lived there with a bunch of young people that I'd met when I was hitchhiking around. Our lives were broken. Our lives were empty. My addictions got worse. My anger, my rage. I was never physically violent with my wife, but uh, there was a rage uh, inside of me uh, as, a, as a very young man. My wife was confused. She had a fairly good upbringing with good parents. The problem is she got hooked up with me. Turned her on to drugs, LSD, alcohol. And it wasn't very long after my wife and I married. We moved from Oregon to Tucson. We're lost. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know where we're going. I have no plan. I have no job. I have no future. We're lost. We're confused. I had a lot of, obviously, addictions that, were, that held my life in captivity. But the worst part of my life at that time was not the physical addictions of drugs and alcohol. It was the emotional turmoil. The, the anger, the rage, the guilt, the darkness, the depression, the, the, the spirit of suicide that sometimes would take total control of my life. But you know what? Tonight there's a promise. And there's an answer. My wife and I became Christians on May 18th, she first, and then me four days later, May 22nd, 1975. We're still very young. I was 20 years old. My wife was 19 at the time. I had been raised in a Catholic environment, but not really, I didn't really learn anything. We're not really committed. We went to Mass most Sundays, but I never paid attention. I never thought very much about Christianity. Certainly, I was looking for answers in other areas in my life. But what happened was my wife and I met some very genuine and very real Christians that started talking to us about Jesus. And to make a long, long, long story short, several months after we met these uh, young men that were talking to us about Jesus and, uh, and about my need for salvation and for forgiveness uh, that I could be changed. Uh, I, I can't explain all the dynamics that were at work, but I went to the pastor's house one Thursday morning uh, and my wife had told him that I wanted to talk to him. I went into his living room, began to speak with him about the need of my life. He began to talk to me about Jesus. Uh, and he said, Paul, what we need to do is we need to pray. 
and you need to pray and you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're a sinner. You need to acknowledge that. And if you'll simply do that, tell God you're sorry, repent. You can experience real change. You can be born again. And of course, I don't understand all that. I really don't. I'm trying to put it in very simplistic terms tonight. But when I did pray, and I was desperate, and my wife and I were empty. We were lost. We, we knew. We had a 10-month-old son. I know it looks impossible, but that guy standing up here is my son, my young little guy up here, 46 years old now. But he was 10 months old at the time, uh, and we prayed or I prayed, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I don't know any other way to describe it, but something happened. Something miraculous took place, uh, and my life began to change. It doesn't happen all at once. Uh, we, we, we take a long time to screw our lives up. We make a lot of bad decisions that result in us being the people that we are. We come from whatever family we've come from, and there's a history uh, that has produced the person we are. So it doesn't change overnight. At least not everything changes overnight, but one thing did change. Uh, I was in darkness. Uh, now I had light. Now I had some measure of understanding. Uh, I was dead in my trespasses and sins, uh, and Jesus Christ made me feel alive. Uh, and my wife and I knew that something had happened. I couldn't have quoted a single scripture. I knew nothing about the Bible. I had never been to a non-Catholic service in my life. But my wife and I began to go to church. We began to grow spiritually. God began to change us miraculously from the inside out. And I used to tell people that I know, that I know, that I know that Jesus is real because I'm different on the inside. I don't think the same way. I don't talk the same way. And the day that I gave my life to Christ was the last day I ever touched a cigarette, a drop of alcohol. It was the last day I ever rolled a joint, smoked hash, or took any other kind of a drug. I was set free, and that didn't happen because I was a spiritual giant. It happened because of the power of God's love, the power of conversion. What he did in my life was so real, I didn't want any of those things anymore. I really didn't. I totally lost my appetite, and I deal today with a lot of addicts. In my ministry, I counsel a lot of them that that doesn't happen when they get saved. Their deliverance from alcohol and drugs may come some period of time after. They may struggle. But my wife can tell you that we took our alcohol, our drugs, and we flushed it all, and we never looked back. It was a miracle. That's why Jesus calls it being born again. It's what it means. I started life all over again on May 22nd, 1975. My wife and I consider those dates, May 18th and May 22nd, uh, our birthdays. And so that means uh, I'm 46 years old tonight. I gave my life to Christ 46 years ago and started life all over again. The best time to give your life to Christ is right now. I know we're here for recreation and I'm all in for it. I love to have fun. I love, to, I love sports. I love recreation. But I wanted to gather you all together here before we start the tournament and remind you that life is serious. Life matters. The decisions you make are going to frame the rest of your life. And I'm so grateful that I can stand here. I mean, I had no idea I would ever become a pastor. I've been a Christian for 46 years, uh, pastoring for 41 years. My wife and I have lived overseas. Uh, we travel the world, or we were traveling the world before coronavirus, uh, preaching at various conferences, going from Africa to Australia to Russia to various countries in Europe, South America, Central America. I do that every year. I get to preach. I get to share my testimony, uh, minister the Word of God. Uh, I had no clue, no idea, no understanding. Standing, uh, as a 20-year-old, uh, broken, uh, alcoholic, suicidal, depressed, uh, what God would do in my life. Uh, and I don't know what God has for you, but he has something for you other than what you're now experiencing. That's all I can tell you. God has a plan for your life. I love quoting the scripture in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, when God takes his 15-year-old boy and says to him, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So before you were ever born, you're not an accident. Before you were ever born, God knew you. He has a plan for your life, but that doesn't guarantee you're going to experience that plan. You have to respond to his love and his grace. 
Jesus said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You've got to come. You've got to answer the call. You've got to say yes to Jesus. And this can be a, a, a game changer, as it were, in your life. If you'll make a decision tonight to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and go on and live for God and stop the vicious cycle of inherited curses, of the sins of the Father playing out in your life. You don't have to continue in brokenness or depression. You don't have to continue in confusion or fear or any kind of addiction. Jesus Christ really is the answer. That's for the message that I preach, and I preach it not because I read it in a book somewhere. I've experienced it in my own life. A real miracle changed me 46 years ago, and that miracle awaits every one of you. I want you to bow your heads with me tonight, please. We're going to have my son come in just a moment, but before he comes, I want you to bow your head. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody moving around for just a moment. This gathering tonight is a miracle. It really is. I had an appointment with God 46 years ago when I sat in my pastor's living room and he began to talk to me. I had hair down to the middle of my back, lost, confused, woke up that morning, smoked a joint to get the day started like I did every day. But by the time I left his home, I was born again. I began a brand new life. My mother and father, as a result of my wife and I being born again and converted, they both got saved. They've since gone on to be with Jesus, but they lived for God for the last 25 years of their lives. My father delivered from alcoholism. My mother delivered from her mental illness. Jesus invaded my family. My brothers had opportunity, but they walked and turned away. You have a choice to make. Jesus talked to a rich young ruler one day and told him what he needed to do. Jesus said, I want you to come and follow me. And the Bible says he turned in his heels and walked away from Jesus. That's how powerful your choices are. They're going to determine heaven and hell. They're going to determine a life of, of deliverance and blessing now and eternity going forward. Or you're going to just go back to your same old life. Struggles, depression, loneliness, brokenness. You may not talk about any of those things with anybody, but those are the facts of who you are. So as our heads are bowed, as our eyes are closed, nobody's looking around, I want you to think about the question that I'm going to ask you now. Would you be man or woman enough right now to admit your sin and to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? We have lots of young people in my church, just like this crowd, confronted like this with a message that's clear, concise, anointed of the Holy Spirit, and they give their lives to Christ. We have kids come out of the hood, the ghetto, poverty, dysfunction, illegitimacy, brokenness, addiction. They're hearing the message of Jesus Christ and they're responding. It's a message that people long to hear. Is there hope for me? Yes. There's hope. There's hope for victory and joy and peace, stability. So as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody's moving around for a moment, I wanna ask you that question. Will you allow me to say a prayer for you to receive Jesus as your savior? You know, there's such a thing as getting sick and tired of being sick and tired. Tired of my life. Here you are, 18, 19, 20, 25, maybe 30, maybe older, maybe younger than that. You had enough, you're worn out. And you're gonna wear yourself out more. You're spending so much negative energy on, on what's going on inside your heart and mind. You don't have to live the way you're living. You don't have to be who you are. You can be a new man, a new woman in Christ Jesus. He loves you as you are, but he needs to change you, help you, forgive your sin. I love the Psalm that says, he has reached down into the pit in the miry clay, drawn me out and set my feet upon a solid rock. That's how I feel. I was in a pit. I couldn't get out myself. He got into the pit and lifted me up out. That's what Jesus does. He died on the cross to pay the price for your sin. That's how much he loves you. You've done wrong, you've been wrong, you are wrong. 
And it's time to draw that conclusion and be in agreement with God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. That's what the Bible says. You can be a decent person, but still a sinner. Think of all the people around your life that you've hurt. Parents, maybe brothers, sisters, husbands, someone you've been living with, children, because of sin. We rationalize, justify, oh, they'll get over it, they'll be okay. But they aren't. Because coming into contact with you has not been a good thing. Because of your sin, our sin affects other people, the sins of the father. It's gonna be passed on to the children to the third and the fourth generation. No dad wants that. Every father that I talk to that's in that position would say, oh, I love my children. And I have to say, well, this is what you're doing because of your sin, you are ensuring future struggle for your children unless you get your act together, serve God and do right. So as our heads are bowed, I wanna conclude my part of the service tonight by praying for you. And if anything I've said describes you, if anything I've said makes you want to repent of your sin and give your life to Christ, I wanna ask you to do something. Every head is bowed, nobody's looking around. I wanna ask you just to lift your hand right now and say, Pastor, I need prayer. I want you to pray for me. I wanna get my heart right. God bless you, son. I see that hand. Anyone else? Lift your hand right up and join this young man. God bless you. I see that. Thank you. God bless you in the back. I see that hand. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I'm going to just take a few moments. I know this is a little different. This may not have been what you expected tonight, but nevertheless, God's having an encounter with your heart tonight. Please lift your hand and let me pray for you. If I can do this for you, God bless you. I see that hand. Anyone else? God bless you. I see that. God bless you, son. I see that hand in the front. God bless you. I see that right now. Anyone else tonight, lift your hand right up and join these. If you lifted your hand, you can put it down. I'll remember who you are. All over this building, please lift your hand right up. I, all I want to do is pray for you. You got nothing to lose and everything to gain. And you know that you know that what I'm speaking is true. Some of you have Christian background. You've been to church. You've heard the gospel. Maybe you had a grandma that told you about Jesus. I don't know. But when I preach like this, there's a great big yes going on inside your life. And you know that if you died right now, you're not going to heaven. You're not ready to stand before God. We have a pastor in, uh, in Los Angeles right now who, who the doctors have said may not make it. We're praying for a miracle. Life is serious, beloved. He's ready for eternity, are you? If he passes into eternity, he's gonna be placed right in the arms of Jesus because he repented and he got, gave his life to Christ as a young teenager at an outreach of one of our churches in Los Angeles 20 plus years ago, just like you. Would you lift your hand right now? All I wanna do is say a prayer for you. Maybe you're backslidden. A backslider is someone who has lived for God and then turned away. Something came up. I'm not really interested in the whys of why you may have backslidden, but you grew up maybe serving God, or maybe at some point you received Jesus as your savior, but you're not living for him now. And I wonder if you wouldn't lift your hand up and say, pastor, that's me. I'm, I, I want to rededicate my life to Jesus Christ. Here is my hand. One more time all over this building, lift your hand right up. God bless you. I see those hands. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you, young lady. I see that hand. Amen. Those of you who may not have prayed, my prayer for you is that a seed has been planted. When I gave my life to Christ, it wasn't the first time that somebody had told me about Jesus. There were two other occasions in my life when somebody told me about the Lord. And so I'm praying that a seed's been planted and that the Holy Spirit will water that seed and you're going to come to a place where you're going to say, I need Jesus and you're gonna repent and you're gonna get your heart right with God. Thank you for hearing me out. We're gonna